Hi, everyone. Welcome to this special episode of Timing Research Crowd Forecast News for August 1st, 2024. Uh, we are recording this at 1 p.m. Eastern Time, and this is episode number 440. Uh, we weren't able to do the show on Monday as usual, so this is a special uh, t Thursday episode with the Option Professor, and he's going to give you his uh, updated market outlook and uh, and information about his trade ideas. So I'm going to turn it over to the Option Professor. Okay, thanks a lot, David, and welcome everybody. We have a very big day in the market here, so I'm going to go through all the different markets in the first half of the meeting. And in the second half of the meeting, I'm going to be discussing uh, the options alert service and uh, what I um, what I distribute to people that I hope every week is very, very helpful. So I'll get into that in the second half. But in the first half, let's talk about these markets because, you know, there's a lot of people who are very surprised uh, on what's going on in the market, and I am not one of them. I am a believer in reversion to the mean. So I'm starting out with the 20 year graph on the S&P 500. Can you see how far away we are from the moving averages? That's the mean. So that's the kind of potential downside you have if we're going to revert to the mean like we did in 2022. So that's why you gotta be very careful getting too excited about the stock market after it has run up a lot. And that's right there in your face. If you go to the five-year graph, again, we are reverting to the mean. We've already reverted to the minimum mean, which is the red line. And that came in at what, 54.32. So we've already penetrated it actually when we went down to 53.90, but it is rising. And again, that is not bad. And again, on a longer term basis, the, uh, the averages are rising, which means you're in a bull market. But a reversion of uh, significance is going to be painful for people who either A, didn't take any profits up here, or B, uh, just started investing up here. Uh, again, you can see it's already dropped pretty sharply down to here. Where could it go further? That's the big key, right? Well, I'll tell you where I think it could go further. Uh, on a really, on a really, you know, Longer term pullback, it can go down towards the 200 day moving average, which is around 49.80. Okay, and that's where the red line comes in. If we have a more moderate one on the five year graph, the next stop would be 53. Uh, whoop, hold on here, 52.87, or even as low as 51.25. On the one year graph, where could it drop? Well, it's right here with all these things. So I'm telling you, I'm I would I would get ready for 53. Um, five, well, right here, where is it at? Yeah, 52.64. So what did the other one say? 52.64. And if you go over here, what do you got? You got the blue line coming in at. 52.87. So right in that 52.50 area, plus or minus 30 points, I would be prepared for that because again, it's uh, it's possible. And on the one year graph, again, your purple line down here. Now on the one month graph, we got very good evidence that it was going to have problems because it ran up to the purple lines here, right? And uh, tried to get above it. And then it filled the gap. And so this break today under purple, which came in at what? 54.47, no, excuse me. Purple came in at 55.35. You can see once we broke 55.35, you lost hundred points and now you're trying to hold on to gold. So again, let's see if this can hold up. If you're trying to be bullish, you certainly would like to see this hold up. And the low today is 54.47. And look at my gold line. 5447. So you're right on something very important. And that's why it's trying to bounce. We'll have to see if it can actually do that. But again, there is a, a, a risk of a more complete pullback. Why? Okay, very simply, I just showed you the technicals, reversion to the mean. And again, some of the charts are rolling over a bit. The one year uh, red line is pointing straight down. That's not good for stocks. Look when they go up. Can't you see the red lines always pointing up? So it pointing down at 5,500, that's a real key neighborhood. So unless this 5,450 gets above 5,500, I would be very concerned that we're gonna go down here. Now, again, the reasoning, that's the technicals. The reasoning is simple. The economic data is killing the rally. Why is that? Because claims are rising, 
Last month they were 235. Or last week they were 235. Now they're 249. But the bigger number is the ISM manufacturing has gone further into contraction mode, going from 48 to 46. And the employment cost index has gone from 49 to 43. And Japanese exports have tanked in the last month. The Nikkei has gone from 42,000 to 38,000. Now you also are facing something called the SOM rule. And what is the SOM rule? The SOM rule is very simple. It was named after Claudia SOM, who I guess was an, uh, an ex-Fed governor. And basically it says a recession is either on the horizon or already started. If the unemployment rate current three month moving average exceeds the lowest three month moving average for the last year by a half a point. Let's put it into layman's term. A recession is either coming or has already started basis this rule. And the track record on this rule is quite, quite good. So the uh, right now in June, it was at 4.3. If we have one more increase in the unemployment rate to 4.2, it will trigger the SOM rule. And guess what's happening tomorrow? the jobs report. And guess what people are saying? We're going to get it. Now, the lady who came out with the rule, Claudia Som, I read somewhere that she thinks it might be wrong this time because the unemployment picture has been skewed because of the pandemic where people were stockpiling employees because it was very difficult to get employees. And now we're just normalizing. So that would be the only caveat to the SOM rule that I see. And again, when people say it's different this time, sometimes that makes me very nervous. So the bottom line, in other words, and when they start saying it's different this time, sometimes it's not different this time. But if it is, it would be attributed to the, um, the uh, a pandemic and the stockpiling of employees and now the normalization of that. Uh, that's looking at this situation in the best light possible. Now, the Fed decided not to cut rates. The, nobody's listening to the Fed. I'm going to show you something right now. The Fed is still at five, five and a half on Fed funds. But what is the real world doing? I'll tell you what the real world is doing. The real world has been driving yields lower. Okay. And how low have they driven them? Well, I'll show you. This is the 10-year note, and it'll be the yield on the 10-year note. Now, you can see that the 10-year uh, yield topped out last year. And that was when, uh, that was when Powell said uh, rate cuts are coming in 2024. And now we're into August, right? So the bottom line is that's where it peaked. But that was when they first said they were going to cut rates. Then the data got bad, meaning inflation picked up, et cetera, et cetera. And so rates went back up to 470. Then again, economic numbers have been slowing since May. And this beginning of the year hike in the inflation, et cetera, seemed like it was an anomaly. And ergo, rates have been declining, and now they're down here. So now you go to the long-term graphs and see where they might stop. Because right now, it looks like rates are in a downward trajectory, which they've been since May. But on a longer term basis, that's why I look at longer term charts. This thing might only be going down to the purple line, which is 384. And that purple line has not been tested since rates started dropping back in 2021. So this is called a reversion to the mean. And the mean comes in at 384. So I'm watching that yield as very important level for it to either stop going down or if it breaks underneath there, then I go to my 20 year graph and I can see the rates could easily go down towards uh, the 343 area, okay? But the, but the moving averages are still pointing up. And when rates are really dropping, all the averages are pointing down. And that's not happening right now. So I don't know if getting the party hats out on rates are gonna drop is such a good idea when the configuration of the long-term graphs are still indicating we're in an upward cycle on interest rates. And the deficits are gonna be huge. And these guys might have to do a lot of printing to keep this economy going. And that's why gold has been very firm. So what does the five-year graph look like? Again, 
Still's got the purple line rising. So I would say it's very important to keep an eye on the yield at 384, and we're very close to it now, because if it breaks there, then something maybe not so good is happening, and they're going to have to print money, and they're going to have to drop rates. And there could be a policy error going on as we speak, because these guys are still up at five, five and a half on Fed funds, and I'm showing you realities under four. So these guys are way off. Somebody's wrong here. And since the Fed seems to be late to the party quite often, like they were on the inflation party, it's probably the Fed. And this SOM rule has a record going back to World War II, which is extremely accurate. You can dismiss it because of the pandemic. Maybe that's correct. If that's correct, then these yields won't stay down. They'll go right back up again. Because if the unemployment rate is still going to be pretty firm, and believe me, anything under 5% unemployment is long is uh, on a long-term basis, firm unemployment. And then if the rates drop a little bit and, and then people start spending a lot again, we're going to be right back on the horse. So that's why I would look at 384 as a key level, because if the Fed does some half a point cutting, because I think the Fed my opinions, these are all my opinions, by the way, uh, is uh, the Fed would like to do major cutting. They don't want to do a quarter of a point. So they're kind of waiting till a problem sets up, uh, just like they did with inflation going to 9%. We're at 1% 10-year uh, uh, notes, inflation jumps to 9%, and then they move it to 5.5% after the fact. So that's their MO. So maybe they're looking for a real, real uh, spike in the unemployment rate and a real break in the economy which we're not getting, the GDP is doing fine. And uh, so bottom line is, is that uh, they're probably wanting to cut a lot when they cut, not little tiny bits. And so that's why they're probably waiting because you know they'd rather use a uh, machete than a, uh, than a dinner knife. Um, okay, so that gives you a little perspective of what's going on. And again, this uh, SOM rule is not a secret. People know its track record and they know we're on the verge. And again, it's not a coincidence that the S&P ran into that resistance zone and that we have this report coming up tomorrow on unemployment. And maybe there's been a leak that the number is going to shoot us into the SOM rule triggering off. And again, a 4.2 uh, unemployment rate tomorrow, according to what I've read, triggers it. And that means you're either going to be in a recession or you're already in one. Both of which, now look at the stock market here. OK, does this stock market look like it's discounting a recession? Let's put up the QQQ. Does the does the Nasdaq look like it's discounting a recession? With this kind of a price, let's look at the five year graph. Does that look like it's discounting a, re a recession at 500? And even the IWM, which benefits from cutting rates, but you have to realize most of the, uh, or a large part of the uh, IWM is unprofitable companies. That's why they have a basket because, you know, they, they need a basket to diversify that risk. But this thing could never reach its all time high. You see that? So you're at, what do you call it? You are at uh, the all time high in 2021 of 245 and you never got there. And, um, the transportation average, I'm sure, is also one that has never gotten to its high. So there is a, you know, this is the time to be a little bit careful with your money, I think. At least that's my view. Um, let's go around the horn. I just showed you the st uh, story. I'll give, well, I'll give you the closed-in story on the QQQ. And again, there's an AI uh, phenomenon out there, but there's a lot of spending going on. And I don't know how much uh, profit it's being turned into in the short run. And so if you discount this AI thing, it's going to be hugely positive for these companies. But then they report earnings and they don't show much action on the uh, return on investment side. You know, that's the recipe of the reversion to the mean, which is exactly what this thing is doing. It was at 500 and it came down to the green line. So it's reverting. It's not in a downtrend. OK, and so if it can hold down here, you know, this is a neighborhood where I would look towards the uh, to the support. So there you go, 440 to where we hit today. 
The low today, 455. Look at my uh, look at my green line there. It's at 454. So again, this is the name. But up here I'm talking about was where I was speaking to people about replacement trades, where you dump the stock and take a limited risk call just to protect you in case if it goes up. Now, all that money you sold out up here, you can buy back in on the dip. And that wasn't a bad idea. Or sell calls at 520 and then buy your puts at 480 and get some insurance going. You know, these are the tactics that you try to use when you're at a high point. And I believe we were at a high point because, again, this is a candidate for reversion to the mean. And you see what it just did? It reverted to the mean. And the red line is pointing straight down. And you'll notice that's not really where prices rise, is it? No. But it is holding purple, which is good. You break purple, you're looking at gold. Let's talk about the IWM. A lot of people have jumped into the old Russell bandwagon. You know, they call it a rotation out of tech and all the high flyers into the cheapies. And so let's see how that looks. Again, reversion to the mean. You had a divergence. Look at this. You see 75 there on the RSI? I'll bet you the RSI on that new high wasn't 75. How about 64? That's a, that's a market that's out of gas. And that's why you're coming down. And there's some of your levels to look for. Certainly 205, you'd want to make sure it doesn't get underneath there if you're bullish. So you're getting a reversion to the mean. The long-term trends are still okay. And now you're trying to find out where you might want to get into some of this stuff if you're long-term bullish, okay? If the SOM rule kicks in and we have a legitimate recession ahead of us, I don't know what that does, but I do know that it would put on the table a much more severe reversion to the mean. And I gave you some of those numbers. So that gives you a little bit of an idea. Okay, that's about as clear as I can get on it um, as far as um, you know what's happening, why it's happening, and uh, levels of which you were, if you were bullish, you might wanna take your pencil out and see if there's anything there. Um, the 28th of uh, uh, the end of the month is going to be huge because you got companies like NVIDIA and uh, Broadcom coming out. And that is going to be huge uh, as far as finding out if these companies, well, it looks like these companies are still spending because Microsoft came out and so did Google and look like they're still spending a lot of dough. And that should benefit, um, it should benefit uh, the uh, uh, NVIDIA. But uh, you can't deny Taiwan Semiconductor which is the guy who produces all of these chips, uh, that their stock has been under pressure. So maybe, again, that's not a bad stock to take a look at here if it's going to hold, but it's under pressure again today. But this was a neighborhood where it could stop and look at the bounce. Went from 152 up to what, 168, not a bad bounce. But the red line's pointing down. And I don't like to fight uh, the Red River because you won't find the market going on extended runs with the Red River pointing south. That's my view. Everything today is my opinion, my view. You know, if you go and ask 100 people, I'm sure they wouldn't agree with me on everything I'm saying. This is my truth. That's why I'm sharing it with you. Okay, let's go around and find out what's going on in the world. We just went over the stocks. I think I was clear on that. Let's go to oil. Well, first, I'm going to go over the commodity index. This is the Goldman Sachs Commodity Index. Okay, and this is about half energy and about half gold and agriculture and metals, okay? So I'm going to go back here and show you on a long-term graph. Well, let's go to the five-year graph. That's good. Well, here's the deal. You see the green line here? It tried to get through 600 in September of last year. Couldn't do it. Tried to get through 600 again in April. Couldn't do it. Right now, it's at 54, uh, 549. It's down into the support zone here. Okay. I mean, you know, 500 is going to be a very key number. Let me show you uh, here. You see this very key number here. Now this is, and this is the area where it better stop. So what's your number on that? Your number is 528. Okay. What's the low bin? It's in the 540s. So again, you can see it stopped here again, but it's having a heck of a time getting through 600 because the purple line is right there. And that is a barrier. My point is I'm watching like a hawk, the oil and the gold market, because if they print, if they panic, then there's a possibility 
that we could see the commodities take off, which would mean your copper, your gold, and your silver, and your oil, and natural gas, and whatever, okay? And agriculture, okay? So I'm watching that very closely. If we were to get above 600, it would open the door to fill this gap over here. And the last time we filled that gap, oil was between 100 and 110, which would mean there's a heck of a lot of potential in oil. If it can hold, well, let's go over to oil and talk about it. CLU. Now, first of all, I want to show you something on oil. It's called backwardation. It means the front month here of September is trading at 77. Now I'm going to go to the December contract. That's called the backer, the, the later months. And you'll see it's not at 77, but it's at 74. And if you go out even further to March of next year, you will see it is trading at 73. So when that phenomenon is going on, it's called backwardation, which means supplies are very tight. Not extremely tight, but they're definitely tight. And that is not a negative for prices if supplies are tight, right? Because they're paying more for immediate delivery than deferred. End of story. Okay, now let's take a look at the trends here. This is oil. And the oil stocks are in trouble today because this oil is in trouble as well. Just like I told you on the uh, commodity index, it couldn't get through 600. This baby can't get through the purple line. Just topped out again. That's why I was telling people as we went into 83, uh, 80, you know, 83, 84, there is a lot of resistance there. Okay. If we get above there, then I think it could fly, but it's not above there. So I wouldn't be bullish on oil until it broke because, again, it can't go to 90 or 100 and make a big gain for you unless it gets above that number. And now it's holding on for a bit of dear life because you can see all the moving averages on the five-year are above the price. And the, the gold line comes in at um, 70. And look at all this down here. If we break underneath there, there's a substantial downside risk. If you go back to uh, the one-year, Again, red line's pointing straight down. It rolled over right here in the 81, 82 area. And it's holding on for dear life at the gold, which comes in at what? 76.95. What's the low today? 76.87. So this is a very important neighborhood. Okay? So that's the story on oil. Got to get above 83, 84, 85 if you're going to make big money on it. And you got to hold... Uh, I would say, obviously, where we are now would be one level for sure, and that's 77. And then you better hold the uh, one down here, which is uh, at 70, 71. Okay? So it'll be very interesting. Obviously, if there's a full-blown recession and things are going to slow down, that probably wouldn't be so bullish for oil generally uh, without a uh, geopolitical event. Okay, let's turn towards gold. Now, gold... Uh, hold on a second here. Yeah. Gold in September is up $8.60. Now, again, here's what I see on gold. Basically, as long as it can hold 2300 2500 I think you're okay. If, you, if it can't, it's going to put some of these longer-term averages. So if this has a reversion to the mean, gold will go down to 2129 if this has a reversion to the mean, remember I told you 2300, very important to hold. Now let's take a look at the RSI. RSI here is what? 77. Next high, RSI, 63. Another big new high, where's the, where's the RSI? 64. What's the RSI here? 67. When you're in the 60s, only in my view, my opinion, only one of two things generally happens. You are on the verge of an acceleration phase where the RSI will go to 70 or 80 or you're at the top. And that's what I'm telling you right now on the gold. If the gold breaks up to new highs like 2,500 here and keeps going, then obviously that RSI will go from the 60s into the 70s, and then it might even go into the 80s because there could be a huge panic into gold, okay? But if it can't get above there, 
and I believe in what? Reversion to the mean? Then I would be somewhat concerned up here and I'd be very careful of gold up here because it looks to me like it's going to be binary. Meaning what? It's either going to take out 2,500 and you'll be at 2,700, 3,000 maybe on a panic or it's going to revert to the mean if they think uh, if they think everything will slow down. But the reason it's holding its bid, whereas oil... Because, you know, again, if usage of oil goes way down, obviously that's going to be a problem. And uh, and uh, but with gold, they're concerned that with a deficit and a slower economy, the printing presses are going to come out in full force. And that's why it's up on a day like today, because, again, those uh, economic numbers are not showing a boom. And we are very high on everything in our life. It cost a hundred grand to buy a car. It cost a million bucks to get a house. It cost 200 bucks to go out to dinner. Everything is very expensive. And if there were to be a recession, are you trying to tell me the price structure wouldn't collapse a little bit? That's why they're into the gold. And that's why, you know, everybody kind of thinks about having a portion of your money into gold as kind of an insurance kind of thing. Now, uh, a lot of people also look at the Bitcoin. Let's take a look at Bitcoin. Digital gold, sometimes they call it. I consider it more of an alternative currency type thing. I'm no expert on it, but this is the one that I follow. And this is what I told people to keep an eye on. Okay, grayscale Bitcoin. Okay, again, this is more, uh, again, with a slowdown in the economy, they are obviously selling this thing off because I'm going to show you where I thought it was a good deal. And it was. But here on a long term, uh, you could pull back reversion again, reversion, reversion, reversion. It's, it, you know, this is what, you know, when it's up here and I tell people at 60, it could revert down to the red line or the green. Obviously, they think I have three heads, but that's what happened. And then when it goes back up into that neighborhood and see if you go here at 80 and you go back in the neighborhood and you're 64, that tells you that rally is made out of paper mache. And then it's going to revert back down again, which is what it did. Now we're way up here and these things are down here. Again, this is where I thought it was a good deal. And that's why I said right here back on uh, July 8th, that if you want to play it for a bounce, this is the place where it bounces. And it went from 48 to 60. You had a pretty good deal there. You know, you could have got out there when it was up there, right? He goes, look, the RSI hardly went into like, remember, I told you, if it can't get through to 60s, you're not going to get an acceleration phase or it's the top. So what's the RSI there? 61. You never got into the acceleration phase and look where you are now. Now, where could it drop to here? There's a big gap down there. Now, again, this is supposed to benefit from what? Printing money. And again, if we go into a recession, like the SOM rule says we might be, printing money is going to be happening. And uh, this guy, obviously, uh, Powell and this Fed, they go to extremes. They keep rates at 1% until real estate goes to a million dollars a house. Then they bring it up to five and a half. Really didn't do anything to anything yet. And now if things weaken, they're going to try to what? Keep this world where a million dollar house is norm, $200 dinners are norm, $150, $100,000 cars are the norm. Well, they're going to have to print a lot of money for that to occur. And they're going to have to lower interest rates dramatically. And what's that going to do to things like Bitcoin and gold? It could get scary on the upside. Okay, so we'll have to see. But right now, the reaction today from weak economic news is to sell it and bring it back to what? The reversion to the mean. If they bring it further, this thing's got a uh, timber look to it. You know, this thing obviously has a gold uh, thing here that comes in uh, much lower than we are now. And again, you know, uh, the red line is trying to start turning down here. You know, again, the red line goes down. It seems to go down. Red line goes down. This seems to go down. So, you know, if you're bullish, you want you don't want the red line pointing down on anything, in my view. OK, uh, so we went over the gold. We went over the Bitcoin. Silver is going to be the same story as gold, only more so. Right. Um, and then, well, let's just take a look at it. We got a second here. SIU. This thing is a thinner market than gold, so it can get much more volatile when it wants to. Uh, and again, it seems to be a little bit firmer because it already had its correction down here. So 2750, 28, that's your neighborhood where it has to hold. But again, the red line pointing straight down, that's not my friend, if I'm bullish. 
Again, gold line comes in here, and the RSI is underneath 50. That ain't good. And this is more of an industrial metal. So obviously going into a recession would not be helpful for industrial metals, right? I'll show you a stock uh, that would not benefit from that, Free Freeport McMoran. Obviously, this copper. How much copper do you need during a recession? Probably not that much. That's why it's tanking. Red line's turning down here on the five-year. It already gave you, so it gave you a sell at 50, gave you another sell up here at 52, gave you another sell at 50 here, and now it's holding on for dear life. So you want to monitor this neighborhood to see if it's going to hold. But the red line pointing straight down is nobody's friend if you're bullish. And how far, if it breaks the gold, could it go? I mean, if we go into a full-blown recession, well, you got purple under 40, and then you got the gold way down here. So that's an industrial metal. Give you a little bit of an idea. Um, okay. So uh, now I wanted to go over the U.S. dollar just real quick. And the U.S. dollar uh, has been pretty firm. Uh, but we'll have to see how long that lasts because uh, it is, see, when all my moving averages come together, something big is going to happen in my view, okay? So right there on the five-year, look where all the averages are. Didn't it say 104 like five times? Well, like, give me a tip. 104 is going to be a very key area because it's either going to make a decision that it's going to break under 104 and open up the door for a nice big drop or it's going to surprise everybody for whatever reason, because maybe the whole world looks like garbage. And what are you going to put your money in the yen? You're going to put it in the yuan? You're going to put it in the euro? I doubt it. So if uh, things get hairy, the dollar could maybe even go up simply because why? It's the one-eyed man in the valley of the blind. So keep an eye on it. But that is a formation to me where something will be happening. Like when it came together here at 104 and it jumped up to 107, where it came, they all came here at 102, and then they jumped to 108. So when they all converge, it's generally a prelude to something large happening. So be prepared for a significant move in the dollar, I think. Now, let me show you the other currencies, because the Japanese yen, I can't even believe they have a currency. Look at this. I think you'll be a little shocked right now when I show you this. This is the Japanese yen's currency. Now they went to an all-time high on their uh, on their stock market. In fact, they went back to a 1990 price that somebody thought never would happen again, uh, like 38,000. They went all the way up to uh, like 42,000. But look at their currency. Since 2012, which is like 10 years ago, right? It has gone from way up here to way down here. That's called 50% of your currency out the window. Okay, so they have been buying their own uh, securities to keep rates low. I think they just hiked them a little bit here, which has killed their stock market. The stock market went from 42,000 on the Nikkei all the way down to 38,000. Um, and uh, again, there is probably a huge divergence here, which would tell you that this could be the bottom of the yen. There's your RSI at 15. And then you made big new lows and the RSI is 41. I would be somewhat constructive on the yen down here because that kind of divergence is a big divergence. And that would indicate the selling is dried up. And of course, ever since it hit the low here of 62, it's now trading up at 66. So obviously it has turned a bit. That's a downtrend by any measure, but doesn't it reek of reversion to the mean? So again, that's something to keep an eye on. That obviously would be uh, saying the dollar might drop. Uh, let's look at the Euro. Now, again, you know, Japan, you know, their demographics isn't great. A lot of old people over there. Uh, Europe's demographics and uh, Europe's uh, situation, you know, not that robust. They got, what do they got in the Euro? 17 countries, I don't even know how many. All have different fiscal policies. Just imagine it. It's like a company saying, here's, I'm a company stock, and we've got 17 subsidiaries that are running their own deals. So really, you got a very big risk with the Euro because of so many countries are in on it. So the thing is, is uh, what does it look like here? Let's see. Okay, uh, uh, going back on five years, this thing is again, similar to the dollar. So if the dollar breaks down, this thing's gonna go and it'll probably go up towards the uh, gold line at least, which is where at 111. We're trading 108. And if it breaks 111, then it might go on a nice big run. Conversely, they're all joined in here, just like the dollar. So imagine you, you can imagine this would be obviously something to entertain 
buying a strangle, where you buy a call and a put, and you're looking for all heck to break loose before expiration. And I think that wouldn't be a bad thing to price out. Limited risk on both sides and anticipating some significant volatility doesn't look like a terrible idea. And again, all the things are converging there. More than likely, we should get some activity coming out of there. So that's your story on the currencies right now. And now I'm going to go around the world and give you a little taste of what these other markets are doing. Because, you know, the international markets do have lower valuations and some believe better values. So I'm just going to give you a quick taste of some of the markets. OK, and then I'm going to get into the things that I do with the markets. So hang in there. Be patient. OK, uh, China. When you look at China, I look at FXI. Those are your large cap China stocks. Let's take a look and see if anything's cooking. China is lowering interest rates. They're trying to get their thing going. OK, the five year graph still doesn't look very good. So this thing here, I wouldn't be more interested if it can get above purple. Purple comes in at twenty seven thirty six. We're at twenty five thirty. Can you see by being patient and waiting for it to break above twenty seven thirty six? you might be in a position to see this thing come back to revert to the mean. Whereas if you get in here now and it breaks blue, who knows where it's going underneath, okay? So that's the story on the, the China big cap. K-Web, that's your internet, China. And K-Web, let's see if it's the same kind of story. Again, everything's locked up in here. You'd like to see this thing above 28 bucks, it's at 26 bucks. Is 28 so long to wait for? So again, if you get above 28, you might be able to go after the gold line. And then basically on the one year, is there anything showing me that that could happen? No. So you can see, still on the defensive, they, their uh, real, real estate situation is a nightmare. And so again, not time yet for China, as far as I can see. Emerging markets, you know, those are the uh, developing markets over there. And that includes China to some degree, probably the same story. Okay, where do you want it to hold? You want uh, this to hold at uh, 41.77. Otherwise it opens the door for further drop. The trend seems like it's trying to rise, but again, you need to get this thing above 44. You know, when you buy something at 42, don't you wanna see it to go to 46, 48, 50? It's not gonna happen unless it goes above 44. So I'd be more interested in 44 than I would be right here. That's my philosophy is get on trains that are going someplace rather than getting on a train you hope will go up or a train in New York that's headed to Miami and you hope you're going to get to Boston. You know, that's a tough racket. Okay, the next one, let's go over to Europe and see what's going on over there. Because these would, you know, if they drop rates dramatically here and they can get this thing going, uh, they already started to drop rates in Europe. And so Europe is looking in a lot better shape than of a lot of them, right? But again, it's a slow, steady climb. But the bottom line is, is it's in a constructive state. And uh, as long as you can stay above the blue line here, that would be constructive. Otherwise, you're going to revert to the mean. And that's what's going to happen. So again, got to hold this blue line. Comes in where on SPU? comes in at uh, 41.39. So you're right there. And then you've got the banks. And I always like to look at the banks because you see our bank can do well when our situation is well. And so uh, the European banks, how does it look? Again, you got to hold uh, 22. If you hold 22, you're fine. If not, you got a reversion coming. You got a reversion coming. This is a time to be careful. I don't know how you guys feel, but I mean, I don't want to be involved in big, heavy rainstorms. I'd rather be on the sideline for them or some type of protection, you know? Uh, okay, so there you got uh, Europe. And now just to give you a quick uh, view on um, the UK, because, you know, England is not part of that uh, Euro thing, right? And they obviously, I think they're the richer company, a country over there. So uh, that still looks quite good, right? And uh, again, possible reversion of 34. And you really got to go 37 to get the thing rolling. On a one year again, trying to hang in there. So bottom line is, is that, you know, it's on the verge of a potential reversion down to something like that. Uh, Latin America, you know, Mexico, we're exporting all these jobs there. They got a new president down there. Uh, you know, a lot of things could be happening down there, but they are giving it up. Again, 
I love this uh, country on the way up here. You had a nice long trend up to about 70 bucks. And then you started getting, you know, uh, some uh, signs of uh, a top, you know, you had this there and then it all rolled over at 68 and it's been on the negative. Then they had the election. You got a pop, but it couldn't get above gold or purple. And now you're back in the soup again. So right now the RSI is at 35 over here and 27 and over here it's 37. So this would be a neighborhood to keep an eye to see if it's going to support. Otherwise, where else could it go? Well, it could go down to 50. So again, if this baby can hold this low and start getting above purple, and then they can start turning the red line up, which doesn't look like it's going to happen overnight. Uh, but again, it is also a potential reversion trade if things got better. But right now, there's still a downside uh, bias to it, especially on a day like today. Uh, the guy over there in uh, Brazil is making changes. And uh, I don't know what that's doing to the Brazilian market. This is Latin America. These are the two players in Latin America that I like to look at. And again, uh, this thing doesn't look very good. And uh, again, you know, this is on its way to Miami. And if you're hoping it goes up to Boston from New York, you know, you're not, you're not going to get there, right? So uh, it's still, now it does look like a little bit of a divergence down here. You know, you got 26 and this is what? This is 34. But again, the trend is down. And there's a reversion possibility, you know, all the way up to 30 or 31, if they ever got it to turn. This area here had better hold, obviously. And again, it's having trouble to green line. So if you got to close above 28 bucks, that would be a positive. And it might go after, obviously, it might just go after that uh, gap there. But, uh, you know, if you think uh, Latin America might be a good place, you know, this is some of the ways you play it. The one that has been a good place is India. Um, uh, Apple is kicking butt over there. Uh, their economy is, uh, you know, a lot of a lot of positive uh, words coming out of it. And so this has been the, the strongest of all of them. Uh, as you can see, look at the five year graph. You know, this thing gave us a buy signal at 40 bucks and it's never took, uh, you know, it pulled back to the line. That's where you buy. You want to buy on a dip. That's your dip. You just got a dip here. Now up here, what's the RSI doing? 67, and then the other one over here is 68. So there's no divergence up here. And uh, of course it could revert to the mean, you know, 56. Uh, again, let's look over here, RSI 68. Now you're up here at 63. Little bit of a divergence on a short term, okay? And like I say, if it had a full blown correction, uh, you'll come down to 53, like it did here. But uh, India's got uh, a fairly reasonable story uh, looking forward. So you would keep a little bit of eye on there. Okay. I don't want to run out of time. So we only got about 20 minutes. I'm going to show you some of the stuff that I'm into. Okay. And then I'm going to invite you to get the uh, service that I've got. All right. So what I like to do here uh, in my news, uh, my options alert ideas is I like to look for a number of strategies, uh, including credit call and credit put spreads to bring in cash, long-term options on things that I think could be long-term good. But mostly I'm looking at these strangles and I've been trying to work these strangles. Now a strangle is where you buy a call and a put at the same time. And I've been trying to look for things that are gonna have news and events ahead of it where you could get quite a bit of activity. So I'll give you some examples, obviously past performance, not indicative of future results, and again, you know, uh, these are not recommendations or advice. They're strictly my ideas. Okay. So let's proceed from there. Put, I'm going to put Apple in there because in June, I had a very good experience with Apple and I'll show you why. And once you do the strangle, you'll have limited risk. And then once the strangle moves, you have to make some decision on where you want to do to get out. So here's the deal uh, on Apple. If you go back to June, right? This market was trading between 185 and 195, and they had a worldwide developer conference going on. And so I thought it was a good idea to buy a two-week option with a call at 200 and a put at 190. Before the meeting, thinking A, I can see it's in an uptrend, so it could blow out to the upside, or, and also the RSI was right at 60. What did I tell you? If you go through 60 and get into the 70s, you're going to accelerate to the upside. What's the RSI here? 75. What's the RSI here? 78. That's called an acceleration. I thought it was on the verge of that possibly. So I made a bet. 200 on the call cost $1.86. 190 puts were $1.50. So for about 325 plus or minus, 
maximum risk. I had the right to buy at 200 and the right to sell at 190. Yes, it did come out with a good news with the AI going into the cell phones, et cetera. And we popped within a couple of days up to 200. The $200 call is in the money by $20. That means the $186 jumped to 2000. Okay, that doesn't happen all the time, but this is why we play the game. Okay, now, obviously, you know, when things go up, you know, you got to make a decision to sell at some point. So you could have sold it here or here or whatever. But the main thing is the initial idea was a value. All right, then we've had earnings season coming up, right? So I'm going to show you some of the stuff that had uh, July expirations that are gone now. Bank of America. Bank of America, before their earnings, was trading between about uh, 38 and 40 bucks. I went out and I looked at the 4150 calls and the 3950 puts, and the expiration was July 19, and it cost about 100 bucks for both of them. After they came out with earnings, it popped up here, and obviously the 4150 calls jumped dramatically. Now, again, when it jumps up, you know, you got to take some money out. All right, because if you hang around and it reverts back to the mean, you're going to be right back in the soup. And actually, if you went out more time than I did, you could have made on both sides. Like, say you went out a month, you could have made a hit on the calls and you could now be making a hit on the puts. And obviously, the banks going down is somebody telling you that the Assam rule is going to be coming. Because obviously, if we go into a recession, do you think everyone, since we're at record levels of credit card defaults, I think not record, but 2012, and uh, uh, car repos are supposedly up 23%, I don't think the banks are going to be in great shape because if you've been to the mailbox lately, if you have any kids, you know, they're going to, they're, there's applications for credit cards to anybody who can walk and chew gum. That can't end, end too well. Uh, anyway, so that was one. Uh, I'll give you another one, J.B. Hunt. And again, they all don't work like this. I'm showing you some examples and I'll show you an example where it didn't work. Uh, JB Hunt, okay, when it was down before earnings down at 155, 160, my idea was a 170 call and a 150 put for $2.69. When we jumped from here up here, and again, reversion to the mean, which is what I believe, right, can happen. Uh, the calls went to like $8. Now, of course, it come back down again. Then back up again. So if you're a trader, this thing has been pretty good back and forth. Uh, another one out there uh, that expired uh, in uh, last month would have been General Motors. There's another one where, you know, if you went out in time further than I did, you'd obviously been able to make uh, on both sides. So let's show this. You know, a lot of people take my ideas and they tweak them, which is exactly what you're supposed to do because everyone has their own trading style. But here, do you see this? Like I tell you, when all my moving averages converge, I think something big's going to happen. So here I went with a 47 call and a 46 put and uh, expiring on July 19th cost again, a hundred bucks. We jump up to 50, the calls are going for three or better. And if you went out more in time, you could have also made what? Good money on the puts now. So that's why I like these strangles. But you, hey, listen, if you buy heavy premium and the market stays in a window, you're going to lose money. So I'll show you one that didn't work. And then I'll show you the best one we had last week. So here's Abbott Labs. And again, this is another classic case of I could have bought more time. If I bought more time, I probably would have made out better. But let's take a look. I did a one. Yeah, exactly. I would have done better. Uh, the market was 104. I bought a 107 call and a 100 and a 101 put. Cost 195 bucks. Expired on the 19th. No, this one expired last Friday. Okay, so we got to run up to the purple line. At that point, the calls were two dollars in the money, and so obviously you probably could have got your money out of it there. And against the purple line, you might have said, "This is a not work. This is not where I want to be. Let's take the money and run." And then when it went down here, you might have got some action on the uh, some. Well, this happened after this happened afterwards. But here you got a little bit of action. But again, if you went out more in time, your 107 calls are now two dollars, three dollars in the money. And it looks like something's going on here. And look at that RSI. 
So there's something that looks like it might be breaking out and there's a gap up there. So if you're a trader, you're kind of looking for that 116, 118 to go get filled. And with the momentum right now at 64, what did I tell you? If you're going to go to 70 or 80 now, then we're going to go fill that gap. So I just gave you an idea to keep an eye on right there. The only way this will this the only way this won't work is if this is a false breakout, which is possible, except for the fact that the RSI here is making new highs. And that's that's not a bad thing. Okay, but that's one that didn't work. You know, it didn't, they don't double and triple every single time. That's why we diversify the ideas. Now, here was the home run derby for last week. Taiwan semi. I'll show you exactly where I come up with the idea. Okay, Taiwan Semi, before their earnings came out, was trading up at the highs here. So I noticed that you had RSI here at 75. That was a high point. And now they're going and making new highs, right? But the RSI here is only 71. That's a divergence. And here's a brand new high, and the RSI goes 62. That is my indication that this thing has run out of steam. And if you run out of steam at the all-time high, that's not good especially when you've got a reversion potential down to 150, which I thought it did. So just because, again, it's up here when I'm trying to do my thing for July 16th, uh, 26th. So I take a 215, I, my idea was the 215 call and the 180 put for a $500 total price, total risk. And then basically what happens after earnings is it goes down to the purple line last week. And so Last week at 150 area, the puts were worth about $30. So obviously the put alone would be in the money by almost $3,000. Total risk on this thing was 500. So obviously that's another big one. They all don't work that way, but they can if in fact it's a stock that has a significant reversion potential. Okay, so that gives you some of the ideas, you know, and again, some of them don't work. Some of them do, you know, uh, again, we had Alcoa, you know, I don't, I'm not in any one industry group. I, I generally go to where I think the setup is proper. Alcoa is obviously a metal company. And this one here, uh, was trading at around 40. So I did, uh, on this idea, it was 42 call and 36 put. And the total price was $139. We got a pretty good drop here, obviously, uh, down, uh, towards uh, 32. And obviously the puts were in the money by a decent amount. And again, they're still having trouble here. But again, the idea is to try to buy these at a fixed amount. And then when the uh, premiums on one side or the other, you know, go up a, a reasonable amount, you, you grab the money on them. And again, if you want to tweak these things, obviously it's a free country. So you tweak them. They're just my ideas. Uh, and people uh, like to take my ideas and then tweak them to their own prejudice, meaning sometimes they like to buy more time. Maybe they like to, uh, uh, you know, uh, change the strikes on it. Maybe they like to uh, weigh it, you know, do more puts than more calls if they think something's going to happen. So, you, you know, people do all kinds of things. It's a free country. Right. But the point is, is I identify where I think significant volatility is coming. And that's very helpful. Um, this week. We had uh, from last week's uh, report, we've had some activity that's pretty significant on some things. So let me show you something from last week's reports. Okay, so uh, we had JetBlue as an idea. And so last week we were talking about the calls at $6 and the puts at $5.50. And the total on that was 68 cents, which means 68 bucks. They announced earnings and it popped up here. Now, if it pops up here, you know, the calls are going to go nuts and you can sell them out and hold on to the puts because you're not going to sell out an option at zero, right? In other words, when we go up here to 720, 740 area, the puts at 550 are probably at zero. Now they might even be in play because we're back to six. So when you have a two-sided trade, if one side goes almost to zero, Sometimes people hold it because even once in a while, it could come back into play. But that was obviously a good one. I was looking for big volatility and I got it. Another one was Starbucks.
What did I see in Starbucks? Same thing I see on a lot of them. That's why I, that's why I like these ideas. Starbucks is trading between 74 and 76 going into their earnings. 78 call and 67 puts. Actually, uh, I even looked at the 70 puts, but a, a 60, 78, 67 a combination uh, expiring on August the 9th uh, was going for about 200 bucks. And when their earnings came out, the calls alone were in the money by almost $400. So obviously that was a pretty good jump. And then obviously you're still holding on to the put if you grab the uh, grab the call money, and then by, uh, obviously the puts could come into play if this thing goes into the tank. But that I was looking for volatilities to get a spike to try to make some money, and it happened. Um, another one uh, was Apple, and that's still open because Apple announces today. So on Apple. Uh, we were looking at a 227 call and a 207 put for $4 expiring on next Friday. So uh, that was when Apple was right here on the blue line. It was around 217. Obviously, we jumped all the way up the other day to uh, 225. Obviously, uh, the option on the call side obviously must have gone up significantly. So if it runs into this stuff and you want to grab the gain, you could hold on to the put. And now the uh, stock is back here. Or you can hold them all over the next Friday. And maybe this thing's going to go up and fill the gap, which is what I thought it might do. And that's up at 235 area, which would make the 227 call quite more valuable than four. Um, and uh, AMD was another one that got a spike and then it fell. Put up that. So, you know, once you get the volatility and you have, you know, uh, the expansion of the premium, Obviously, you have to act. But on this deal here, I went with, uh, let's see, we had a 155 call and a 120 put for a little over $3. And it expires next Friday. Obviously, I did this when it was down around 140. So the 155 puts got a lot of action the other day when we went all the way up to 153. And so obviously, the call jumped dramatically. And obviously, you could have taken some money out of there. And now you still own the put. And for all I know, it's going back towards 120. Because it's down eleven dollars today, and it's underneath everything, and the red line's pointing down. So that's an example where volatility can happen on both sides. But again, the ideas that the ideas that I produce is the entry where I think these options are fairly priced. The stock is at a point where volatility could be happening. It might be happening because of earnings. So I am focused on earnings because earnings have an ability to move. Now you've got the recession fears. That's a double thing that makes it move. So I'm trying to find things that have not moved yet. And this weekend, I'll be going for next week's earnings to try to find out those stocks that have the same kind of setup where, you know, it looks like the premiums are nice. It looks like uh, the volatility could be happening and it looks like it's worth a shot. And that's what I do. All right, we're at the top of the hour. Um, there is a way for you to get involved in this, and here's how it is. Uh, I can send you a link and further information on the service. You get weekly, here's what you get. You get, as soon as you uh, register, you get a options masterclass. That is a three session, six hour educational course on options done by myself and Daniel Sinig of tradingindicators.com. And you get it absolutely free. As a standalone product, it's $397. So you're getting that absolutely free. A lot of you people could learn more about options. I can learn more about options or be reminded of the fundamentals. That's what this thing can do. Second thing is, is you get the weekly update where I give different ideas that I think look attractive, particularly in the area of strangles. Okay, so you get the course for free. You get the um, you get the uh, updates uh, on the strangles that I think look attractive. My ideas, and then you can do with them what you want. And then basically, uh, you get a market commentary like I just gave you in the first half, where I go over all the markets and try to identify things that are going on. That comes with it as well. So you get an awful lot for your money, and all it is is ninety seven bucks month to month. So obviously, if you sign up and it's not your cup of tea, you hit the unsubscribe button and then you're out. If it's your cup of tea, you like it, 
You feel like it's a value, you continue. You always get to keep the course. So basically on a bare bones minimum, you're signing up and you're paying 97 bucks and you're gonna get a course that obviously standalone is almost four times that. So that's a good deal. And also you're gonna get four weeks of information that you're going to be able to evaluate. So that's a good deal. Um, I was supposed to have some kind of a link to show you, but I don't see it. So all I have to tell you is this, I have an email address, option, O-P-T-I-O-N, professor, P-R-O-F-E-S-S-O-R at gmail.com. Option singular, professor at gmail.com. All you got to do is shoot me over your phone number and I and your email, obviously, because you're going to be emailing me, uh, and I can send you by email uh, what you are uh, looking at. Uh, I guess you can see, uh, yeah, right there, you have the link. I believe, uh, to the alerts right there. So if you click on that link, right, all you've got to do is click on that link and put in your information. And again, you'll notice you're getting a discount of $100, which I'm extending to people who come to my meetings uh, uh, under um, uh, on, the, on the new subscriber. So you're getting a $100 discount, bringing the price down to 97 bucks. You're going to get a uh, full um uh, options master class video, which you keep, and it's three sessions, six hours of material. So I'm sure you can learn something on that. And then you get my updated ideas every single uh, weekend. Okay. And uh, I'm going to be pulling this offer of this 97 because, you know, it goes for 197 in other areas. So this special $100 discount is not ad infinitum. I'm encouraging, encouraging you to get started. And again, Put it in perspective. It's month to month, 97 bucks. You know, it costs more than 97 bucks to go out to dinner. So one day a month, don't go out to dinner and you covered it, right? And you're walking away with a course that I know will be of value to you because I put it together with Daniel Sinig. I shared a lot of the information, obviously, that I have over decades of knowledge. And so I think that'll be very helpful to you. I try to set up something that I think is a very fair and good deal. And so I hope you take advantage of it because again, I will be at some point pulling the special $100 discount. So this is the time. To, and also we have earnings season and I'm working with strangles that are based on what? In need of volatility. When will volatility possibly be pretty decent? I'm gonna take my guess and I'm gonna say earnings season. So again, on Sunday, I'll be going over next week's earnings and see if there's any opportunities there where I think in my judgment, the idea would be a call and a put on that might work. And generally, I'll be going two weeks out. So it'll be uh, expirations in uh, August 16, uh, which will take next week into consideration and the week following. All right. If you have any questions, also, you can use my email to contact me. But I am encouraging you to take advantage of it because, again, uh, you have an um, exit strategy if it's not for you. And that's the unsubscribe button. So it's really a $97. Let's give Jim a try kind of deal. So that's basically what I'm asking you to do is give me a try for at least a month. Okay. All right. Thank you all for being here. I appreciate it. Again, if you have anything else for me, you have my email. Otherwise, good luck and good trading. And uh, I hope you do join up and I can guarantee you one thing. I'll do my best to come up with good information for you. Okay. Have a good day, guys. And we'll talk to you soon.